going to begin a new series that I'm excited about. We're calling it Lost and Found. Because this series is about how you and I can have influence in our world in ways that we were designed and created for. A way that sometimes it gets, that we can miss, but this is about, this series is about having influence in the people, in the, in the lives of the people that we love, the people that we work with, the people that we live around, people that sometimes we fail to realize what we've discovered, the good news that we've come to recognize that's made a change in our lives, that we have a responsibility to let that be known to all. So I want you to take note of this. In fact, I want you to circle this on your calendar. We're going to lead up through this series. On September 10th, we're going to have a special service because this series is getting all of us ready. But on September 10th, we are going to have a special service that's not for us, but for all the people in our lives, our friends, family, loved ones, neighbors, coworkers, the people that desperately need to know what has changed our lives. And it is gonna be our privilege to be able to celebrate and have them know that this is for them. So we're gonna to work together on that end and be able to influence because there's nothing greater than understanding that God has given us the privilege of partnering together with him to reaching and influencing the people in our world for eternity. And that's so critical, so important. So as we begin the journey today, let me ask you this question. Have you ever gotten lost? Yes. Have you ever gotten lost? I mean, when you ever get lost, it can be unnerving, it can be scary. I tell this story and it goes to, it goes to prove a fact that they tell you, you know, in your early 20s, your brain's not fully baked. So when I was thinking about this story about my life, I tell often how stupid I was because I look back on it and through my older years and go, wow, that was really, really dumb. But when I came to know Jesus, okay, I was 20 years old and I was hungry for God. I wanted to know him. So I had this idea in my head. I'm going to go away and spend time with God. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go camping in the woods, okay? I'm going to get on the Appalachian Mountain Trail, which I wasn't even sure how you do it. But I just, I didn't even tell anybody. This is how dumb this is, Okay. I was just, I packed my bag, okay, my backpack, I packed my tent, and I headed off to Litchfield County, okay, and so I got there, and then I was like, well, where do I park my car? So I found a set of woods, and I just pulled my car up onto the side, okay, left it there, and headed into the woods for three days, okay? So I went out into the woods, made a, found a place, made a campsite, pitched my tent, Okay, and so in the point, in a couple of days into it, you know, I was just going to fast. I was just going to seek God. I, you know, this is what was on my mind, okay? I didn't, but here's the crazy part. I didn't tell anybody I was going. And these are the days before cell phones. I didn't even bring a compass with me. I'm talking about stupidity at the, with a capital S, okay? But I decided, I was hanging out in my tent for a day and a half. I was like, you know what? There's a mountain up there. I'm thinking I'm going to climb that mountain. It'd be a better view up there. I could worship God on the top of it, okay? So I head up this mountain. Now, how many of you know that if you head up a mountain, you gotta come exactly down the same way? Because if you come off just a small bit off, by the time you get to the bottom, you could be miles off from where you were. Yeah, in my stupidity, I climbed up, and then there was all these bugs up there, and it was just like, oh, it was better back in my tent. So I'm gonna head back down, this so I started running back down the mountain. Not realizing that I, first of all, didn't even know where I was, okay? Nobody knew where I was. And then all of a sudden, I got down to the bottom, and I'm like, nothing is familiar. Where am I? And after searching around for a few hours, I started to get nervous. Because I'm like, oh, my God. If I die up here, nobody would even know. <laughs> in fact, nobody in my family knows where I am. I don't even know where I am. And so eventually, thank God, I started praying, God, help me. Help me, Okay? <laughs> And I got back to this place where I saw something that was quasi familiar and I found my tent site. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna stay here for the next while. Because when you get lost, it can be scary. It, be, it can be unnerving on that front. And it's important to realize because you see, it's kind of like the guy, because as Christians, you know, this, this Christian guy was out on his boat, okay? And there's this storm. He hears it on the radio, the storm's coming in. And he's like, God, 
I believe you're real. You're going to deliver me from this storm. God, you're going to save me. I pray right now. I believe it. And a boat drove by, stopped up and said, hey, did you hear about the storm? The guy says, yeah, don't worry about it. God's going to save me. Because they're like, come on, you want to come with us? Our boat's a little bit. No, 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 no. God's going to save me. So they couldn't convince the guy, so they left. Storm's getting worse. This helicopter sees the guy struggling down there. The, the, the storm's getting worse. They pull down long enough. They burn down the rope ladder and say, hey! They shout down from the, from the megaphone, hey! This storm's getting worse. Why don't you grab the rope ladder and come up? We'll take you to safety. No, no, no. God's got me. I prayed. God's going to save me. He's going to move miraculously. God's going to save me. So they couldn't convince them, so they flew away. The storm gets even worse, okay? Now, everything, the waves are going high. The guy's like, God, you're going to save me. And all of a sudden, boop, a submarine pops up. <laughs> and they realize that there's this boat that's in trouble. They pop open the hatch. They say, hey, come on in. You know, this is really bad. They go, no, 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 no. God is going to save me. He promised me. I prayed. And they couldn't convince them, so they leave. The guy's boat capsized. He dies. He goes into heaven, and he's like, God, I'm so angry with you. I prayed that you would save me, and you did nothing. He said, wait a minute. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. I even sent you a submarine. What more would you want me to do? Because <laughs> it's the reality of it is, sometimes we don't see, honestly, the way God's working. And to me, there can be nothing more unnerving. Being lost at sea kind of, to me, I don't know, that's kind of like the worst reality to it. But the Bible gives us this understanding. If you've ever read, especially the Old Testament prophets, they, they cast this idea that the world at large, that large groups of people are like a sea. And really what happens is, like seas, there are currents. And you can get swept away in a current. In fact, Hebrews 2 tells us that we need to consider more earnestly the things that we believe so that we don't drift away. See, currents in today's culture are things like trends, ideologies, stuff that catch people up. And even though they think they're doing good, they can get caught away and be dragged into things. And the next thing you know, they're lost. Because the truth is this, okay? And this is what I want us to understand, is that today's message title is, we were all lost once. Because what does it mean to be lost. What does it mean to be lost? See, when you don't understand why you're here, when you don't understand what life's really even all about, you can get caught up. And honestly, people are wandering in life. It reminds me, when I was 16 years old, I'll tell you this story, because somebody had an influence in my life. But when I was 16 years old, my mom had died when I was eight years old, okay? I had no real relationship with my father. Both my sisters had moved out. They were much older than me. So I was alone in this situation. And I thought I fell in love. And at 16 years old, love to you at that moment is the whole world. The first girl I ever really gave my whole heart to. But the problem was, she didn't even have the guts to break up with me. She started going out with one of my best friends. And I found out, back channel west. Now, you got to remember, when you have this, when you're 16 years old, and you, my, my, I really had no oversight, and I didn't have anybody to talk to, I didn't feel, okay? I was so, at that moment, heartbroken. To be truthful, I was suicidal. And nobody to talk to. But thank God, at, I went to Stanford High School, okay? The black, Go Black Knights, okay? But there was a man in our school named Mr. Blackman, okay? And for some reason, somehow, Mr. Blackman took a liking to me. And Mr. Blackman was a black man. He, he was from the Bronx, but somehow he always would go out of his way to intersect with me. And in this particular time, Mr. Blackman was kind, and he said, he knew something was happening in my life. He said, Ken, I need you to come and see me after school today. And I began to open up to him about the heartache I was going through. And he said to me, Saturday, I'm coming to your house and I'm gonna pick you up and bring you to mine. Now, different era, different time, okay? But literally, Mr. Bron Mr. Blackman lived in the Bronx. I was in Stanford, so it's not that all that far, but listen, he showed up at my house on Saturday morning and brought me to his home in, Bro in the Bronx. His wife made us lunch, we played chess, and he said, hey, I'm gonna take you somewhere. I have no idea where this place was, okay? 
But it was a grotto in the, in the city somewhere. And, you know, people went there to pray, and there was this water, you know, and that, that, that spewed. It was like a... Uh, and no, 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 here God uses amazing things in ways that we don't even see sometimes. Okay? But Mr. Blackman starts talking to me. He's like, hey, listen. He said, you know, when life gets difficult... You just need to take the opportunity to talk to God. See, now, at that particular time, one of my favorite artists at that time was Stevie Wonder. And to me, the best album he ever produced, bar none, was Songs in the Key of Life. Okay? And there was a song on there called, When Life Gets Too Hard, Go Have a Talk with God. So Mr. Blackman's talking to me, and he's like, listen, Ken, I know this is difficult. You're going, but here, I'm going to tell you what to do. Just, you know, when you feel like you're going through these difficult, dark times... Light this candle, drink some of this water, okay, and just have a conversation with God. Now, I was Roman Catholic growing up, okay, so I had a respect for God, but I didn't know you could have a relationship with God, okay, and no disparagement to the Catholic Church, but guess what? For me, it was really confusing, because as a kid, I thought the only way you could have a relationship with Jesus was when he was alive, because most of my theology came from movies that I watch, like the greatest story ever told, or Jesus of Nazareth, okay? So I was like, man, I wish I was alive when Jesus was here, but he's in heaven and I'm kind of on my own, okay? And it was confusing because I used to get, you know, like upset. I'm like, you know, when I would sin, I would do something bad. I'd feel horrible. And then I'm like, God, why do I got to wait to Saturday to go talk to the dude in the booth to get forgiven? Why can't I just ask you now? But you see, it was confusing to me. And that's kind of no disparagement. But you see, I was lost and didn't even know it and at risk. But you see, Mr. Blackman took the time to care about a kid that maybe nobody else really all cared that much about. And I tell you what, he saved a life. See, so often God can use us in ways that we don't recognize, that we don't understand how much of an influence, how much of a difference we all can make. Because here's the big idea today, listen. Life is a journey and everyone is heading somewhere. You, so many ways, so many parts along the path of my journey to Jesus, God used people in very, very unique ways. In different ways. See, too often we try to categorize things without realizing the Holy Spirit is always working. And God works through so amazing different ways that sometimes we can miss it. And God is wanting us to understand that life is a journey, okay? And everybody's heading somewhere. What's important to realize is this, is we were created for a purpose. But purpose is in the mind of the creator. And one of the reasons we are so lost in our generation is that people have no clue why they're here and what the purpose of life is about. In fact, forget the world at large, 80% of Christians, statistically, don't know their purpose. Why do you think we tell you at Vertical? We want you to discover your purpose because when you are doing what you were created to do, whether you're a teacher like Mr. Blackman, whether you're a worker in the bank somewhere, whether you're a construction worker, God can use your life in significant ways just being who he created you to be, to recognize that we were designed to be partners with God. God's working on the earth, but he has chosen to work through us. And that's the important thing that we need to understand because we can either work with God or we can work against God. And that's why it's so critical to realize because why? Rick Warren wrote a book a number of years ago and it's down to people because it's sold in the millions. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. Why did it sell? Because it touched a nerve. People want to know, what is this all about? Why are we here? Because if you buy into the secular viewpoints of culture at large, it's the idea that, no, you're not in control, that, no, 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 you're just dancing to your DNA, there is no God, or all the rest, all the craziness of our world. No, you were created by God and for God. We were created to be partners with God. And that's why when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus' mission, he came on this realization to restore God's original purpose. See, when God created humanity, he had something in mind. 
He said, let us make, God, make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every living thing that creeps on the earth. In other words, mankind was created for partnership, union with God. And to, in essence, God gave his good creation over to humans to create a world of thriving that benefits and helps the lives of others. But what happened? We all know. Sin entered the picture. And the amazing thing about humanity, the image of God got marred because at the one time, mankind can make some amazing things that truly help life. But at the same time, we can create some stuff that destroys life. And when you don't understand purpose, and that's why Jesus told stories to help humans rediscover who God really was. Because that's where we struggle. The enemy has always sought to confuse humanity to who God is. And Jesus came along telling stories to help humans understand not only who God is, but what he's like, what he loves, what he cares about. And so one of Jesus' most famous times of telling stories, he tells three separate stories all with the same theme. Something highly valuable that becomes lost. And then a search is made, and when it's found, it brings great joy. And he comments, because he says, first, it's like a man who had 100 sheep, and one wandered away, and he left the 90 and 9 and went after the lost one. And when he discovered it, he put it on his shoulders, called all of his friends and family together, and had a big party. And then Jesus comments from heaven's point of view. He said, so is their joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and comes home than, in fact, than over 99 that don't need to at all. And he tells a story about a lost coin. And when the coin is found, the same realization, a huge party unfolds. And he says, and so there is joy among all of the angels in heaven when someone who was lost becomes found. And then he tells the most famous of all, the story of the two lost sons. I know we think it's one, but it's two. Because you know what it means to be lost? It means to want everything that's God's without a relationship with him. And that's what our culture, that's what secularization is. It wants all of the goodness of God without God. And that's why we've misunderstood. I mean, Christians have massively misunderstood the subject. I even dare to bring it up, but the subject of hell most people misunderstand hell is not God torturing anybody. Hell is ultimately God giving humans what they want, an existence without him. God is love, and he never forces humans into a relationship with him. He shows his goodness. He displays his grace. And he opens the opportunity. But guess what? You cannot have choice or can't have love, I should say, without choice. So God never forces humans into loving him. And what people don't recognize nor understand is this. What does an existence look like devoid of the goodness of God? It's a place of regret. It's a place of horror. In fact, when the Bible gives us a little glimpse of an understanding, people in hell never want, they want their circumstances to change. They never want God. And that's the realization. It doesn't come that way. And the realization is that God has loved humankind. And that's what Jesus wanted us to understand because when he tells about the two lost boys, because why? There's, we identify with the kid that went away and just went and lived his own life, did his own thing, right? And he came home and there's a big celebration, but we forget that the oldest boy that was trying to do what was right was trying to do what was right to make his father do for him he didn't want a relationship with his dad. He just wanted his dad's stuff like the younger boy did. Okay? And the father begged both of them to come home because listen to what Jesus concluded. He said this. In Luke 15, 32, he said, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. See, that's how God looks down on the earth. His heart breaks for the ones that are lost. And he wants them to be found. See, the word lost, Pastor Frank used this a couple of weeks ago in his message, did a great job with it. But listen, in the Greek, the word literally means to destroy, to destroy utterly, to kill. 
But figuratively, I want to dig a little deeper. The word figuratively means not made use of or claimed. No longer possessed. Not able to find the way. And that's where humanity finds themselves. Because we were created by God for a relationship with God. And when we lack that end of it, we lose out on what life was supposed to truly be. In fact, the word found literally means to find with a search or without it's to find by inquiry, learning, or discovery. You see, Jesus' mission, he told us, he said this in Luke 19, 10, he said, the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. Why? Because I've quoted this already to you, but in Colossians 1, 16 says, all things were created by him and for him. But listen to the way Jesus said it. In praying, he said this in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life. See, we think eternal life has to do with duration of time. No, it has to do with quality. The realization of what life was supposed to be. And this is how Jesus describes eternal life. It's the Greek word zoe. He said this, and this is eternal life to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, we were created to know God, to love him and enjoy him forever. We were created to be partners with God. The dignity and understanding of what humanity was in the eyes of God is that we were to be partners, workers together with him, accomplishing his will on earth. And that's what Jesus came to restore because mankind was made to reflect the image of God. The characteristics of God, who God is. We were to display that to the world at large. But we know that sin marred that image. It created the opportunities because every time a human being has ever acted selfish, that's totally the antithesis of who God is. And the reality is now through Jesus, we've been invited to restore a relationship and be changed back into the realization of what we were in design and created by God. To be, to be his partners, to be the ones that he works together with and through. And that's why it's important that you and I have this understanding as we go into it, because this subject matter can really, a lot of Christians get nervous about it. Today's times, it's not even all that talked about that often, but the subject of evangelism. And so listen to me, this is, this is so key I want to get to Evangelism is not intended to be a salesperson on a sales call, but rather a travel guide on a spiritual journey. One of the things that people hesitate and withdraw from is because all they've ever known of evangelism is this high-pressured, all-out sales pitch to get someone to buy something that they don't even necessarily understand what it is they're trying to hold. Because if you've ever been in that, I mean, you know, when, on my journey, I was curious, God had been moving in my life. And on Labor Day, I, was just, I had just turned 20 years old. On Labor Day weekend, I had gone to my aunt's house, okay? And my family, I came to realize, you know, my, I, my sister had come to know Jesus, and I was like, what's up with that? I, I, what do you mean? We were raised Catholic, of course we know Jesus. She said, no, 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 I have a personal relationship, but it didn't make any sense to me, okay? In fact, when I started living at my sister's house, we had this deal, you know, I, I watched her house during the week, because she lived with my aunt down in Darien. And so I took care of her house and I could live there rent free. If I cleaned the house, took care of the outside, all the rest of it, it worked out as a 20 year old college student, okay? And so we were working on it. My sister used to invite me to come to church. I'm like, you go to church on Friday night? I'm like, shock, get a life. Come on, who does that? That was crazy, but there was a curiosity I had. So I was talking and my family starts sharing and my cousin had said something to me a couple weeks before and he has no idea how much it really got in me. Because we were talking and you know what? I'm not going to admit that back then. I was 20 years old, full of testosterone, really wa wanting to go out to clubs, wanting to do my own life, my party life and all the things I was doing. And I had enough common sense. I wasn't going to play games with God. If I was going to make a decision, I'm going all in. Okay. And at 20, I wasn't sure I was ready for that. Okay. But my cousin said something to me. We were talking. He's like, you know, Ken, if I die, and I'm wrong, I died a happy fool. But if I die and I'm right, where does that leave you? I didn't want to admit it. 
oh my goodness, I went home, I wrestled with that. And I was like, maybe I ought to check this out some more. Maybe I ought to, you know, understand this a little bit better. So, you know, we're talking that night in my family and all of a sudden my cousin and his wife, my God, she's, she's away, but she's really bold. But man, all of a sudden they heard, I'm talking about Jesus upstairs. So they come up and all of a sudden, it's like, it's like going to the car dealership. Some of us hate that end of it because, you know, like when they take you in the room, they lock you in there and they kind of go, well, we got you know, to go talk to the manager. And you're not going to leave that place until you buy the car. Anybody ever been in that situation? You hate the full, full all-on sales pitch approach where you're going to knock, you know. Well, my cousin and his wife, they don't realize that the more they're pressing me, the more they're actually making me withdraw. I'm like, man, come on. What are you talking about? And they're like, come on, I can't believe you would leave here tonight and not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. What happens if you get into a car accident and you die? I'm like, I'll have to take my chances. Because I was like, the more you're pressing me, the least I want what you got. And I want to say this because I really want to take you off the hook because sometimes we thought evangelism was this high-pitched approach that you're forcing people to sign on the dotted line. And I want you to know that evangelism isn't a sales call, a salesman on a sales call. It is a travel guide on a spiritual journey because we're all heading somewhere in life. All we need to do is allow people, let our lives be, a, be, a, be, a, be honest about what God's been doing in our lives and invite people to come and see. No pressure. Just check it out for yourself. It had an impact on my life. You see, being a travel guide, that's whether you realize it or not, sometimes you can give people travel brochures. That's what literature and Christianity is supposed to be about. Because I was reading some of that stuff. My cousin didn't realize. You know, he gave me this Christian comic book. And he gave me this other book. You know, at first I threw it in my room. But, you know, when God was starting to really get a hold of me, and I was wrestling with that thing, yeah, what happens if he is right? So I started reading this stuff. Wouldn't tell anybody, but I was reading it. Okay? And God was getting a hold of me. And the key is this. You can give people travel brochures. You can be a travel guide, which takes all the pressure off it. Because, listen, the high-pitched sales approach doesn't really work well. And that's what you and I need to recognize, a pro, the, the relational approach. Jesus made something. Listen, this may sound heresy to some people, but I challenge you to look at this in Scripture. Jesus, in his approach, was totally relational, and he allowed people to belong before they believed. And we're, one of the best partners that we have for evangelism is community. Inviting people into community, allowing them a safe place to be able to ask questions without having to sign on the dotted line. Because why? Jesus, with his own disciples, think about this. Jesus' disciples followed him, because that's all his question. All he said was, follow me, right? He allowed people to get to know them before he ever had the DTR talk. Anybody ever date and you know what the DTR talk is? Determine the relationship? Okay. <laughs> It's like one of those times, like, we've been dating for a couple of years. We've never really, where is this heading? Okay. Ladies, sometimes you need to be bold enough to ask the question. Okay. But listen, Jesus' followers followed him for two years before he ever hit him with this question. But who do you say I am? Right? Because a relationship with Jesus is like marriage. So Jesus says, get to know me. Because there comes a point in knowing him that he'll ask you to determine where is this relationship going. But that's where we need to have the freedom to allow people along the journey to, to belong even before they believe. To not feel like we have to put pressure on those ends of it. That's why, again, community can be so large. That's why September 10th can be so powerful. If you just invite people, say, listen, no pressure. This is all, just, just come and check it out for yourself. And so that's why it's important because listen to me, listen to me. In evangelism, we partner with what God's spirit is doing in the lives of people and provide guidance through, our, through the testimony of our own life's journey. See, God's already at work in the lives of people. So much more. God used this thing like example. Was there anything to the water that Mr. Blackman talked to me about? No. But he opened my consciousness to recognizing God could be a source of dealing with all of the pain, all of the areas that I was struggling with, that he actually cared, and God used it. And God will use so many different things along the journey of life 
to guide us. It's like signposts that are pointing us in the direction of where we need to go. And we can be those travel guides to be in those moments, to allow our lives and our testimonies. But here's the point. You and I need to realize we can't save anybody. Listen to what Jesus said. John 6, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. God loves people. God is not willing that any would perish. That's why he wants us to be partners with him, not work against him. And when we get religious, sometimes when we're even telling our story, sometimes we try to get so technical that we lose, heart, we lose, we lose the reality of what our stories are, why they're appealing. Let it be raw. Let it be real. Yeah. That's what people identify with. We're so often get up in our heads thinking, well, I got to say this and I got to say that. And we get theological and realize that no, just people need someone that they can relate to. Someone that will be real with them. You see, all we're called by God to do is be, again, travel guides. Because taking the time to get to know people, you can begin to help people see God has already been moving in their lives and they may not have even understood the things that he's doing. But you can just let your life be an example See, my life was this journey where God used so many different things along the way before I came to know who Jesus was and then devoted my full life to him. See, it's not a sales call. It's just being willing to work together with what God's spirit is already at work in the lives of people. So how do we be good travel guys? Listen, let me end with three things. To be a good travel guide, number one, you gotta be real. Why? Because people can sniff authenticity, uh, unauthenticity, you know, fake stuff a mile away. Okay? And sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we want everything to be perfect. We have, and we're scared. Okay? And we're not even willing to admit that sometimes. But just be real. Okay? It's just being, I remember this. This, this impacted me so much. One of my really, really good friends, we used to go to, we used to share our faith all the time on the streets years ago. And, you know, we, we attended here together for a lot of years. And then he left to go somewhere. But we kept friends. And we used to get together at night and go to, to Starbucks. But Starbucks closes at 10. And so we were really into conversation one night. They close and kick us out. And so, hey, let's go to Krispy Kreme because they're open later. <laughs> so we walk into Krispy Kreme. And there was a guy that my friend knew. He played basketball with him. Okay. And so we sit with this, this gentleman. We're talking. And he's really spiritually hungry. And it's unfortunate because I'm going to tell off on myself. I felt so horrible afterward. But I flipped into this mode, okay, where I began to share Jesus by this old way that I had always done. And my friend and I both went back and forth. And the guy sat back at one point and goes, man, you guys sound like you're so scripted. And he was so right. You see, it's not about what you want to say. It's about where are people at and making the connection for them. It's like, it's like scratching an itch. You got to know where they itch. You can scratch all over the place and not ever hit the target. You see, I have to learn one of my, one of my biggest, you know, uh, blunders is talking too much. Yeah, I admit it, okay? <laughs> my, wa- my wife will testify. I can, if I look over there, she's like, amen, amen. <laughs> but... Sometimes, you know, my kids call, oh my God, dad just flipped into preacher mode. Okay. But no, no, sometimes it's just saying something and allowing somebody to respond. Knowing where they're at. Allowing them to ask questions. Too often, we want to get out our spiel. We want to make our presentation. Again, that's defaulting into the sales mode. No, it's just saying something and allowing people the opportunity to be human, to respond. Be real. Because the second reality to be a good travel guide is you have to be vulnerable. And sometimes as Christians, we're scared. We think we got to put on the best front. But people know that you ain't got it together. And no matter how much you try to pretend it's all right, they know it. They can sniff it. It doesn't pass the sniff test. They know you're full of it, okay? Because when you, because we too often as Christians, we feel, oh my God, if I ever told them that I ever had doubts, that I ever had a weakness, oh, they might not want to come to Jesus. When we fail to realize the vulnerability is what opens up the human heart to receptivity. That the most intimate relationships 
are built through vulnerability, not through strengths. But we're too busy giving the Pinterest or the, or the, or, or the Instagram version of our story without telling the struggles that we have, without being real. Guess what? None of us got it together yet. Say amen, because there could be relief in the house. That's why I say all the time, church is a hospital for the hurting, not a theater for actors. So stop trying to pretend like you've got it together. Be willing to be vulnerable. Be willing to be honest, because that's what people desperately need. And the third reality is be open. Listen, listen. The third reality as we close today, listen. To being a good travel guide, you got to be real. You got to be vulnerable. And you got to be open and available to the Holy Spirit. Because he's already working. You see, when you come into that realization, God uses different things a long time. And all the Holy Spirit really needs us to do is say whatever he puts on our heart to say and stop there. That's, that's my big thing is putting the brakes on. I only know gas pedal to the floor, okay? And that's what I bowl over people at times. No, 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 Okay? Say what the Spirit says and then leave it there. Let God work because God is working in the hearts of people. You can't save anybody. But the Holy Spirit is, because the Holy Spirit is responsible to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's not your job to try to tell people they're wrong. Your, your job is to share good news that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is what it's all about. You and I, and, and, and I can testify to it because the fact that God loves me is proof because I'm still a work in progress. And to all the people that have ever had group in my home, they can testify to this. I got a bathroom just like everybody else. And it stinks just as much as everybody else's. Because God's still working on me. But all of us can be great travel guides when we're willing to be real, to be vulnerable, and to be open. Because the Spirit of God. So guys, think about it. Who on September 10th can you pray for? Who can you begin to allow God to give you the means in the way? It's not a high-pressure situation. I already did it with some, some, with some of the members of the family. I'm like, hey, love you to be there on that day. Uh, they got a wedding anniversary. Okay, so they're probably not going to come. So I'm going to keep looking, okay? But here's the point. Who in your world? Now, is it, September 10th isn't, a, isn't look, can I be clear about something? It's not about going and inviting all of your Christian friends who attend other churches to come to church with you that day. Okay, I don't want their pastors throwing rocks at me. That's not what this is about, okay? It's about all the people in your world that you live around, that you may work with, or even members of your family that don't understand where you're at in faith. It's like, oh, no high pressure situation. Guys, I hope you can trust me by now, okay? But we can work together and trust that the Holy Spirit will do what only he can do. We can work to see God influence and affect the peoples in our lives that we love that desperately need to know because why life is a journey everybody's heading somewhere everybody's going to live forever somewhere in life and we can be travel guides to change the destination you know what that's why i told you the story we can be mr blackman in someone else's life someone who's struggling someone who's doubting someone who's going through difficulties in life just taking the time to care Taking the time to go out of your way, give of yourself for their situation. You can have an influence. And God can use you to save a life. Amen.